It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce the new director of RPE, Dr. Ellen Williams. Ellen was confirmed as director of RPE this past December and has quickly been coming up to speed on the agency before joining all of us on the stage today. Prior to joining RPE, Ellen served as senior advisor to the Secretary of Energy and prior to that as chief scientist of BP. She's also a distinguished university professor in the Department of Physics and the Institute for Physical Science and Technology at the University of Maryland. Ellen is joined this morning in the conversation by Phyllis Catino, director of the Clean Energy Institute at the Pew Charitable Trusts. Please join me in welcoming Ellen and Phyllis to the stage. Hey, good morning. Well, thank you so much. Good morning. Good morning. Well, it's very exciting to be here today. I've, um, we've both been down in the technology showcase already, and yeah. there's exciting things um, to be seen. Um, so how do, you, uh, how do you feel it's going so far before we dive into our well, I, I'm just excited. I've only been, you know, enrolled for about six weeks, and uh, RPE, I was, came in expecting huge, amazing things from RPE, and it's exceeding my ex expectations every minute. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, now, um, Dr. Martin mentioned that this is your first public appearance since being confirmed yeah. um, in early December, December 8th by the Senate. So before we kind of talk about RPE and your role there, let's learn a little bit more about you. Okay. Um, tell us where you're from originally and how you got interested in, in science and research. Okay, well, I was born and bred in the Midwest, born in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, and I grew up in the Detroit area. So my childhood was sort of infused with the excitement of the Motor City. Uh, as a child, I didn't really know what science was. My dad was an engineer, uh, but I had a great school system, teachers who were very creative and, uh, and encouraged us to look at things in different ways. And by the time I was in high school, I had a great chemistry teacher, a great calculus teacher, and I knew I wanted to do something in science without really knowing what that meant. So went on to college, majored in chemistry because I loved it, had a super undergraduate advisor, and went to graduate school. <laughs> And the rest is history. The rest is history, yeah. Now, you're not the only scientist in your family. That's true. I'm married to uh, another scientist. We got married in graduate school. My husband is an astrophysicist at uh, Goddard Space Flight Center. So we kind of joke that uh, my, my area of specialty is materials research. So I'm always working with atoms and uh, milli-electron volt energy scales. And his field is astrophysics. So he's working with gamma rays and parsec uh, size scales. So we kind of span the extremes of science. And both your children are interested in science, I Yes, my, my son's an electrical engineer, and my daughter's uh, doing graduate work in applied physics, so they, they bred true. So it really does run in the family. <laughs> so now, you've had a renowned career in academia. You're a distinguished professor at the University of Maryland, yeah. in the physics department and physics institute. Yeah. You founded and directed their uh, materials research science and engineering center. Um, then you went on and joined the corporate world as the chief scientist for VP. You've um, worked in, in assessing um, uh, efforts with both DOD and DARPA. Yeah. So when you look back on all those experiences, what is it that you think that are kind of, what lays the table for innovation and scientific breakthroughs? What are the ingredients? Yeah. Well, from, from my career, as I mentioned, I started out my research career was in material science, surface physics, nanoelectronics. And uh, throughout my career, because of the nature of the work, I was always working in kind of an interdisciplinary area. So I worked both with uh, people from other fields, chemistry, material science, physics, chemical engineering, and also really a strong collaboration between experimentalists and uh, theorists. And one of the things that I think has been really shaping over the last 30 years is the power that we now have to digitize our data, get it in place to do detailed analysis. And so we're now able 
uh, in an interdisciplinary way and working between experiment and theory to move our experiments through much faster. We can work with theorists, design an experiment to really test a hypothesis, move it through fast, analyze the data, and then get back to the theorists and find out what it meant again. So what I've seen in 30 years is a vast acceleration in how fast we can learn new things and act on them. It is amazing transformation. So innovation now is easier than it used to be. Innovation has more opportunities than it used to, so we can innovate more quickly. It's still really hard work. Well, and um, now you've done a number of fascinating things, and you're particularly proud of one of the projects you did at, at BP. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so when I was uh, recruited to join BP as a chief scientist, one of the uh, plums they offered me was the opportunity to run their, what was called their Energy Sustainability Challenge. So at that time, and we still are very concerned about um, the interaction of our energy system with climate, as we've just heard from the senator, but also uh, with the other parts of our natural word, world and the availability of water, uh, natural resources such as minerals, will they be limiting in our ability to respond to energy shortages, and uh, uh, land and competition of land for different uses. So when I joined BP, I set up a research program involving about 13 different universities, and we did a really big deep dive into all those different aspects of the interactions among all these different types of uh, impacts on the energy system and the energy system on those. And it was fascinating uh, to understand rather quantitatively how things interact. Uh, perhaps not surprisingly, while energy and water interact strongly, it's still never going to be the dominant interaction. It's still energy with the climate that is the really big connection that we have to pay attention to. And is that one of the driving reasons you think you came to RPE? Well, certainly, certainly the opportunity to have an impact, and at RPE you really can have impact, is one of the driving reasons. But you know, deep down, it's like RPE is the coolest thing on earth, and so <laughs> I couldn't possibly stay away with the opportunity. Well, then let's talk a little bit about your role at, at RPE. So there, you know, it's a fascinating time for the for the energy sector, a yes. time of great transformation, but we still have tremendous challenges. Yes. So at RPE, what are what are going to be your priorities? I mean, what are those those challenges that you want to tackle? Yeah, well, a, a priority, a big priority, is simply expanding our impact. It's it's hard to believe that RPE is really just over five years old in terms of its programs. And when you look at how um, its activities have been filling a pipeline of innovation and really creating changes, uh, that's amazing for a five-year-old organization. And with that basis of uh, the really strong institutional structure and the growing awareness and activity worldwide in energy uh, research, ARPA-E really has the opportunity right now to, uh, to move things forward in a greatly expanding way. So the fact that we take a really focused perspective on innovative, sophisticated techni technological advances and couple that with a very unblinking and realistic look at the market realities is unique among funding agencies. And so pulling that together with the fact that we can be very nimble and constantly pivot to address the uh, key issue of the day, RPE has the opportunity to identify points where a small investment, very focused, can break through, open up a roadblock, uh, knock down a choke point, or create a new pathway to achieving and expanding the impact. So I think in the next two years, we're, we should expect to see the growth of RPE and really the blossoming of all the uh, investments of the last five years. So, and let me, so when you talk about five, a five-year span yeah, yeah. and two years, so how much of your time is going to be spent kind of on the short term, the two years, mm -hmm. and how much will be kind of looking ahead and trying to envision what are the new energy challenges, kind of five or ten years yeah. down the... Well, everything in the, everything in the energy world is, the one thing we can be certain about the un energy world is that it's always uncertain. And so a five to 10 year time scale is, uh, is crucial for that. So for instance, right now, oil and gas prices are low. Will, we, will they stay low? I've seen shocks come up and down many times in my life and I would say, I'm fairly certain that within the next five to 10 years, we will see another oil shock prices shooting up. And even right now, we're still importing 
almost a third of our oil. So we're not independent of those things. So my long-term focus, and I think a natural focus for RPE, is creating opportunities and options because we don't know what the future is and what the future is going to look like. The things that RPE can do is to focus on the unusual, the innovative, and put in place the options so that when the next surprise comes, we're ready to deal with it. So you mentioned oil and gas. Yeah. Um, you know, do you think that oil and gas prices being low yeah. has kind of dampens enthusiasm when it comes to, you know, new scientific um, you know, discovery, particularly when it comes to fuels, or what do you think? Okay, well, oil, having oil and gas prices low is in some sense creating some opportunities. I mean, I see it when I go to the gas pump. I'm paying right. about half as much as I was a year ago when I fill my tank. And so we do have some flexibility in the way we think about our resources and spending. Uh, right now, the market pull for some new fuels may be dampened. But in terms of the enthusiasm for moving forward and creating those options, I see, still see it as very strong and a strong driver because, as I said, the future is uncertain. And one thing I can be certain of is that those low prices aren't something we can rely on. Right. So you, you talked about um, spending and resources. Yeah. So RPE, uh, um, the present, president's budget request, which was released just last week, is, uh, he requested $325 million. Yes. Um, and, of course, you heard strong support from Senator uh, Sheldon Whitehouse. Yes. So it is still a time of, yeah. of fiscal you know, austerity yeah. here when it comes to the budget, and we are just outside Washington. So I have to ask you this question. What is the case that you would make to lawmakers about why an investment in high-risk, high-reward energy technologies is a smart one? Yeah. Well, the, the case is that we need to invest on both the short term and the long term. And I think the unique model for RPE is focusing on the short term, getting some novel technologies into the marketplace so that they can grow and develop. And, at the, and that will then give us the long term basis, sort of as I mentioned earlier, our pipeline of underpinning technologies that are gonna put us in a position in the future to respond to any shock and to lead the world technologically in energy development. And certainly, um, you know this from growing up in, in the Detroit suburbs, competitiveness is very important. Yes. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we, we definitely do not want to lose, as, as, a, as a nation, we definitely want to stay in advance of energy technologies. We want to be uh, really competitive in world markets as well as in driving innovation in our own market. So when you, um, when you finish your term as the RPE director, what do you want to look back and say you accomplished? Uh, well, I'm going to look back at the individual programs. I think I hope, hope many people here had a chance yesterday to see some of the program director's pitches because they were exceptional and really captured some of the excitement of RPE. So as a person who loves technology, I'm going to look back at individual programs with excitement and uh, about what was accomplished in them. I think in the bigger picture, what I really hope to leave RPE with is an expanded legacy where people understand the impact that it's having and the importance of continuing that impact. So in, in addition to the scientific side, outreach and education and information. Absolutely. Great. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's turn to a subject that I know um, is near and dear to your heart and is an obvious priority, which is STEM. Yes. Um, and surely it must be a, as a national priority to get more women into STEM careers. Mm -hmm. So how do you think that can be accomplished? What do we need to do as a nation that really encourages more women like yourself? Um, I think there's several different aspects to that. Um, a key aspect uh, is just the excitement of the challenge. Uh, women, like men, respond well when there's a, a goal and a mission and they want to move into that area. Uh, another aspect I think that's important, maybe a little bit more uh, focused on women, is uh, an understanding of the culture and uh, broadening out the way we think about doing our research and our activities. Uh, science in general and the energy field is no different. It tends to be fairly hierarchical and extremely competitive. Uh, young women or people from other cultures often are trained with different cultural uh, ways of going about their business and their ways of communication. Uh, from my experience, collaboration, teamwork is incredibly important in driving forward uh, the energy innovation landscape. And 
so continuing attention to different perspectives, different ways of communicating and um, behaving is very important to bringing in the groups who are underrepresented now. So is RPE a good place for women? RPE can be There's a, great, a loaded question. Yeah, that's a great place. If, <laughs> RPE has all the excitement uh, and, uh, and, and all the draw. So I think it's a great place for women. Yeah. And certainly has been led by women. And it has been led Dr. by Martin Cheryl. And yeah. And so that's a great and dramatic illustration of, of what a powerful woman can do. Well, and what do you think? Is there a role for gover more, more government work in promoting STEM for generally or, um, and with women in particular? Well, the government um, at various levels, I think, plays a dramatic role in um, providing early opportunities for students to participate in research. When I, when I was in high school, I participated in a summer science program run by the National Science Foundation, and that was probably quite instrumental in me deciding to go into science. And so getting students and young people engaged in hands-on activity and actually participating in research is a great, a great thing to do, and it's, a, it's an important government function. Okay. So let's return a little bit to science, and um, I should ask, what do you think are the most exciting emerging fields of science right now? Of science uh, overall or of energy? Well, okay. of either, <laughs> science or energy. Okay, well certainly, going over to my husband's area, dark energy, which sounds like energy, which is uh, trying to understand why the universe is accelerating faster than, uh, than we think it is, is one of the great challenges of science right now. <laughs> Coming back to more practical things in RPE, the, uh, I don't think dark energy is going to solve our problems anytime soon. <laughs> so, <laughs> so coming back to RPE, I think the exciting challenges are uh, a systems approach. We now have so much power to look at the overall energy system, which is huge and complex, and start to think about organizing it with the power of big computation uh, informatics, distributed sensors, and so things that are historically very difficult because they're hard to measure and control, we can now think about pulling together in ways that have much bigger impacts and uh, can give us a lot of gains without some of the pain we might otherwise experience. Wow. So, <clears throat> so we just have just a couple more minutes, yeah. but um, when you think about um, how innovation happens and the biggest energy challenges, um, what is the role of the private sector in, in kind of the partnership with yeah. government? And okay, well, the I think ARPA-E is a great experiment and a great example of the power of the engagement with the private sector. So what we're doing in ARPA-E is things that the private sector can't do, uh, early stage, high risk, things that are um, too unknown for the private sector mm -hmm. to be able to justify an investment in. But uh, as we invest in those things, we're basically de-risking them. And at a certain stage, we push our little fledg fledging projects out the door and say, walk on your own. And that's the point where the private sector has a great opportunity to step in. And I think our showcase as a, as a forum for investors to come in and see what's, what's there and what's possible is a great example of how we can make that partnership work. And that will be, in fact, one of the great uh, measures of uh, RPE's ongoing success is can we continue to uh, convince and show the private sector that we're de-risking these technologies so that they can make rational investments and, and take them out for further growth. And of course, RPE has a great track record. What, 95 million in grants has stimulated some $625 million yeah. in private sector More support. More than that now, yes. Yeah. So um, yeah. it's quite remarkable. From a little agency to a big, big, big impact. Big impact, yeah. Right. Yeah. So, um, so are there any last words that you'd like to yeah. say to the audience about your role and how excited you are to be yeah. taking it on? And yeah, well, I am, I am dramatically excited to be in this role. I'm planning to spend a lot of time this afternoon in the showcase, and I'm greatly looking forward to that. So um, probably some of you have detected that deep in my inner heart, I'm a true geek. <laughs> there's, nothing I, there's nothing I like more than talking technology. So uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to engaging with as many of you as I can today and tomorrow. Well, great. Well, Dr. Ellen, Ellen Williams, thank you. Welcome Thanks, to RPE. Yeah. Very nice to meet you. Okay. Thanks so much. Thank you guys so much. Thanks, great Cheryl. conversation. Thank, thank you. you.